Hello my friends. Welcome to my channel, Lindy's Magpie Reads. This is the place where I talk about books. I just got back from a trip to Edmonton. I was just there for five days. I had some business to look after to do with the sale of our house there and I took advantage of timing to be able to see Kate Beaton give the Kreisel Lecture at the University of Alberta. Oh, it was fantastic. And I'm happy to say that you can have access to this lecture yourself. Uh, I'm going to include a link down below to the Centre for Literatures in Canada, the organization that sponsors this lecture. And previous year's lectures are there in video format and so I assume that in the future you will also be able to see Kate Beaton's that way. They also publish the lectures in book format through the University of Alberta Press and so you'll find that information in the link in the description box down below. I got my hair cut while I was in Edmonton at the Ultra cuts where I used to go all the time and this salon keeps a Christmas tree up year round and they just change the decorations with the season. So when I was there, it was all decked out for St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> that kind of uh, decorating enthusiasm makes me smile. So on Wednesday last week at uh, noon when my plane landed, I took a bus into town and from there I took light rail transit right downtown to look after financial business. This is uh, an office on the 23rd floor so uh, this is what Edmonton looked like. They had just had a big, big dump of snow. It was minus 21. Quite a difference from the temperature when I left Victoria. I'm so glad to be here in all this green. So from there, I went to my favorite bookstore in Edmonton, Audrey's Books. They had set aside a book for me that my YA book club is going to be discussing next week. There was a long list at the public library here in Victoria, and I was going to buy a copy, but at the bookstore where I asked, they said that uh, slow to supply or something like that. So I thought, <laughs> I'm going to Edmonton. They have a copy on shelf. I bought it there and a couple more books while I was at it. Uh, this is what I got. Weasels in the Attic by Hiroko Oyamada. I heard Seb from Apocalypse Reading talk about this book with the British cover, not this cover. And I'm going to link his video down below and I'll talk more about this once I have a chance to read it. This is the book that I picked up, Simon Sort of Says by Aaron Bow. Uh, and this is what my YA book club is gonna discuss next week. Haven't read it yet. I'll tell you about it in my next video. And I picked up Shauna LeMay's new book a collection of essays called Apples on a Windowsill and I'll tell you more about this in just a sec. So what the first Wednesday of the month has been the literary salon night, the Magpie Literary Salon night that our friends and, uh, and us, we used to uh, participate in. I've mentioned it on this channel before and we've been doing it for years. And it's kind of like a book club, except that we all bring a piece of poetry or other writing and uh, it's often a theme. And then in the circle, we just read a piece of poetry and we talk about literature. <laughs> I love these friends so much. Anyway, uh, I was missing the hot cross buns from Bonton Bakery by my old house in Edmonton. So when I left Audrey's Books, and my next stop was Bonton Bakery. Unfortunately, it was three o'clock in the afternoon by the time I got there, there was no more hot cross buns left. 
and I had promised to bring some to the salon that night. Uh, I just chose something else instead. I was inspired by another book that I was reading at the time to get Canelet de Bordeaux because that book was set in Bordeaux. So anyway, they were a hit. <laughs> uh, and the next day I went back to Bonton and got some hot crust buns. They make hot crust buns here in Victoria, of course. They're not the same. They're not the same. So at the salon, our theme was reprieve. And I had decided to read one of the poems from this collection, Endlings, by Joanna Lilly. Uh, she's a poet who lives in Whitehorse, Yukon. And this collection is all about animals who have gone extinct. Endlings, uh, she says, it's the last individual of a species or subspecies. It has not yet been included in the Oxford English Dictionary. It's probably only a matter of time. Now, because these poems are about species that are no longer with us, they're pretty sad. Uh, she does include humor though. Anyway, the poem that I chose is one called The Last Age, and I'm going to read it for you. Like kittens with mirrors, we believe we can retrieve everything from behind a shiny surface, pick up the pixels and put them back together again. The polar bear, our great white hope, our canary down the mine, is an optical illusion. Polar bears aren't white, they only look it. Their skin is black, their fur is semi-transparent, reflecting arctic light each hair as hollow as a feather's shaft. As tubular fur warms up, algae snuggle down. Isn't that how it goes? Algae met a bear, the bear met algae. The algae is harmless. The only problem is that it causes discoloration. Polar bears are going green. Polar bears are full of surprises, especially as the temperature rises. When Sheba and Inuka in Singapore's humid zoo turned green, they were bleached back to white to exercise our human hydrogen peroxide prerogative. Looking at a ba polar bear through infrared, all we used to see was muzzle and breath, a circumpolar ghost. Now the whole bear emerges. Up at Saks Harbor, NWT, Hunters on a polar quest, $50,000 fee, spotted a dirty blonde bear caught between a rock and a hot place. The guide said shoot, so one of them did. It turned out to be the love child of a heated affair between a polar and a grizzly bear. Polars or grizzlies, growlers or pizzlies, polies or grizzlars, best to keep shooting them dead. Put them out of our misery, out of our heads. There's a woodpecker. Can you hear it? <laughs> so, yes, Joanna Lilly's collection. Um, I finished this collection while I was on the trip and I do recommend it. Those poems are kind of a downer, so I had chosen um, another piece to read at the salon as well from this essay collection that I just picked up, the one by Shauna LeMay. Uh, Shauna LeMay is a poet and essayist and uh, photographer who lives in Edmonton. And I used to work with her at Edmonton Public Library. She was a, she's a good friend. The little bit that I read is from a, an essay called The Loophole, and it opens with an epigraph by Clarice Lispector. Daily life contains within itself the abuse of daily life. Daily life has the tragedy of the tedium of repetition. But there's a loophole that the great reality is exceptional like a dream in the entrails of the day.
and I'm just going to read you a very little bit from the start of this essay. Here goes. The now instant of a still life can be a loophole, a bowl of peaches or a stack of books beside a vase of lilacs can be a fissure where the light gets into the daily, a dream in the entrails of the day, a shortcut to the marvelous, an opening through which to shoot beauty's arrow. The word loophole is used to suggest an ambiguity in the system or law, a site of circumvention. The word comes from the design in a medieval fortress known as an arrow slit or loophole, a usually narrow cross-shaped interval through which an archer may launch his arrows while still being protected from incoming arrows. In the absence of conflict or action, the loophole is a crack where the light gets into the castle. It's a slim threshold between the private stronghold and the threats of the world outside. Ordinary life interests me, but I'm also a junkie for the marvelous and the transcendent and the poetic. When I'm not at home writing or taking photographs, I have a day job where I'm an anonymous, ordinary person. This state is not dissimilar to my role as a minor writer, of course. I work at a public library, talking to people who have a myriad of everyday concerns. The work can be absurdly mundane. Countless recitals of how to use the photocopier, how to print a document, or how to save a file. The tasks are repetitive, but the people are never so. Each one is unique, and working on something of importance to them. I find this interesting and I like feeling useful. And I like it when a small task you've helped someone with lifts a weight and you're both charged, energized, renewed by this brief encounter. I've been asked what it's like to be a writer in a public library with the intimation that I might be better known than I really am. And my answer is that Margaret Atwood could be working the front desk, and people would still just be wanting her to hurry up and put 50 cents on their print account. They'd be tapping their fingers on the desk. And that's from Apples on the Windowsill. So the book set in Bordeaux that I mentioned is called Vengeance is Mine, and it's by Marie Indaye. It's translated from French by Jordan Stump. I heard about this on Sean the Book Maniac's channel when he had a um, mystery guest, Amina Kane. So I'm going to link that video down below. It's a great interview. And Amina Kane said that Marie Ndaye is one of her very favorite authors. She called her a great absurdist. And the other two authors that she mentioned as being favorites are Marguerite Dura and Clarice Lispector. So that was the second time in a week um, that I'm thinking about Clarice Lispector. And there's a third time still coming up. The only book that I had previously read by Marie Ndaye is uh, The Chef which has some uh, magnificent descriptions of food in it, and so did Vengeance is Mine. Uh, this book is about a lawyer who has been hired to defend a woman who murdered her three children. And one of the strange things about this book, um, part of the absurdity, I guess, is that we don't know very much about uh, those deaths. This is more about the lawyer's interaction with her housekeeper, who is in France illegally from Mauritius. And it's just the strangest uh, attention about a document that the lawyer needs to get from the housekeeper in order to help process her claim 
to stay legally in France. It's a very um, moody kind of novel uh, that's all about uh, a narrator, it's first person narrator, the lawyer who uh, is possibly unreliable. Uh, something has happened when she was a girl of 10 years old and she's quite sure that the man who has hired her to defend his wife is somebody that she met then. The relationship between her and her parents is also uh, very strange. Uh, there's something a kind of uh, unsettling about the story and yet also uh, mesmerizing. I would say pick this up if you're in the mood for something dark and absurd. Now the other thing that kept coming up in my reading in the past week has been biblical quotations about vengeance. <laughs> so like the title of the book that I just told you about and in the next two audiobooks, there were also uh, biblical quotations about vengeance. <laughs> Go figure. So first I'm going to tell you about The End of Drum Time by Hannah Pilvenen. This was on the long list for the National Book Award in the States and it is about uh, the Sami people in northern Finland and Sweden and about the start of a, of a religious sect called Lestedius, uh, uh, called Lestediusism. I think that's correct. If it's not, I'll put the correct title on the screen. The end of drum time is about the preacher uh, a real person, uh, Lars Levy Lestedius, who was stationed in the far north of Finland. This is 1861 and he had uh, several children and uh, the interaction between the white missionaries and the settlers and the Sami people uh, a nomadic reindeer herding people, uh, you really see the, the clash of cultures and ideas uh, through the course of this long novel. Now I listened to the audiobook read by uh, Philip Spall. So one of the um, main uh, subjects in this book has to do with addiction to alcohol. So there is a, a little store where a young man is selling supplies, but mostly alcohol. And the Sami herders are, um, uh, they're getting stuff on credit. And this is a, a whole new concept for them. And that whole um, commerce issue, the uh, addictions to alcohol and the clash between uh, nomadic people crossing land in the way that they had done for generations when uh, uh, farmers were starting to move up and homestead in the northern part and so reindeer were walking across their fields and uh, the farmers were asking for compensation for that and the reindeer herders are saying well don't put your field on a, on a migration route and then the next year they come through and a whole bunch of forest has been burned and so the lichen is not there anymore which is what the reindeer eat and so they're back in farmers fields again uh, yeah you can see the kind of problems anyway uh, there's a romance between a reindeer herder and uh, the daughter of one of the daughters of this preacher that's kind of at the center of the story but 
um, what I found most compelling was just the description of life at that time. And it built on a number of other books that I have read uh, just recently about the Sami people. There's uh, Aidnan by Linnea Axelson, Stolen by Anne Helen uh, Lestedius. Her surname is the same name as the preacher in The End of Drum Time. And The Moon Day Letters by Emmy Itoranta. Even though that one is set in the future, there's uh, the, the healer in that book is very much modeled on a traditional Sami healing. And the, the talk about yoiking, kind of uh, vocalization of music making, is in these other books as well. And yeah, so many other aspects of the traditional ways of Sami people. So it's kind of interesting how books kind of uh, speak to each other that way. Um, I have been so fussy about what books I want to pick up. So as you know, there have been uh, several long lists recently announced, the Women's Prize for Fiction, the International Booker Prize, the Carol Shields Prize for Fiction, and usually I'm much more excited when I read through these titles of books I hadn't heard of before. Um, but I, I actually have not been thinking, oh yeah, gotta read that, gotta read that, gotta read that. Um, I've just been kind of picky, fussy <laughs> about what I want to read. I'm still finding lots to read, don't get me wrong. Uh, I'm not in a reading slump by, by any stretch of the imagination, but just fussy, fussy, fussy. That's the way it is. Very much a mood reader. Anyway, this uh, last audiobook that I want to tell you about, Wandering Stars by Tommy Orange. Oh, I love this so much. And I'm not surprised because I thought his uh, debut novel, his debut novel, They're There, so good. Now, I am partial to stories that are told from multiple points of view and they're there and then this wandering stars are both written in that style uh, and there is a connection to they're there um, the people in that first novel we meet their ancestors in wandering stars wandering stars starts in the mid 1800s and there's a young survivor named Star, a survivor of the Sand Creek Massacre in uh, Oklahoma, I think, um, a Cheyenne boy. And we follow him through his life and many hardships and his descendants all the way through to contemporary times. All through the book, uh, a major theme is addiction. There's another connection between the, uh, the end of drum time and this one. Star learns to read when he's imprisoned for something he did not do and becomes really fond of the Bible and the comfort that he finds there, including he quotes passages from Isaiah to do with vengeance. So, as I mentioned, vengeance keeps coming up. And at the start of one of the chapters, there's a quote by Clarice Lispector. Can you believe it? So, that's the third time. I feel like the universe is telling me, Lindy, it is about time that you read a whole thing, a whole book by Clarice Lispector. I'm kind of daunted by her, thinking maybe I'm not smart enough for Clarice Lispector, but 
Anyway, here's the quote. And it's inside myself that I must create someone who will understand. This book is read by a full cast of nine people. It is so well done. It's such a great story. Lots of heartbreak, but also uh, hope and humor. And yeah, this is my favorite of all the books I've told you about so far today. And I hope that I've piqued your interest in these. Let me know in the comments down below what you think. Uh, I always love hearing from you in the comments, so please uh, send me a little message down there. So thank you so very much for watching. I will see you again soon and bye for now.